This is Dan Abbott. I'm making this video for the Sea Time class in marine science at Southern Maine Community College. This is going to be an overview of the nautical chart, not how to use it for navigation, but how to read it. I'm going to start with one of my favorite charts, the one of Casco Bay. Um, we're looking at the basically the title block, the title block information. If you look at the entire chart, somewhere, normally in the upper left, but not always, there is going to be an area that has information about the chart itself. A lot of it is stuff you don't really need to know, but if we take a look, the things you probably do need to know is what the chart covers. It always has a title of some kind. In this case, Casco Bay is the uh, Casco Bay in Maine. Portland Harbor, we'd say Portland Harbor and vicinity. So I've got two charts up here, the Casco Bay and the Portland Harbor chart. Always has an indication of projection. It's virtually always Mercator. That just means that there's some distortion in the sizes of land masses. That distortion is minimal, in fact, unnoticeable. When you have a small enough area on the chart, the larger the area, the more it gets distorted. What that means is at the top of the chart and the bottom of the chart, things are a little bit larger or smaller than they really exist. And as a result, the scale along the side expands or contracts as you go up and down. That's normally not an issue with the scale of the charts that we're using for this class. Actually, it's never an issue. So what you have here after Mercator projection is you have the scale used for the chart. This is a ratio. The number on the left represents the, sh the chart itself, a distance on the chart. That's true of everything that you ever see that has a scale on it. A map might say one inch is 100 miles and one inch equals one mile. The one inch represents the, the map. The other side of the chart, or the other side of the colon represents the real world. Scales come in either ratios or they come in units. In the United States, is the only place that uses units. Everywhere else in the world, it's just a straight ratio. So it doesn't matter here what the units are. The real world is 40 times larger than this chart of the real world. If you took a banana and put it on the chart and said, huh, the distance from here to here is one banana, and the real world is 40,000 bananas. The actual units used on nautical charts are universally nautical miles. But the ratio simply means that the real world is 40,000 times larger than the chart. This is only true, by the way, at the center of the chart. That's because it's Mercator projection. But again, that doesn't really have much effect when your chart covers a small area. The larger the number on the right, the larger the area covered by the chart. The smaller the number on the right, the smaller the area, but the more detailed. So if you look, Casco Bay is a 1 to 40,000 chart. Portland Harbor is a 1 to 20,000 chart. That means Portland Harbor covers only half the amount of area, but it covers it with more detail. So it's the right chart to use when you're maneuvering or navigating in close quarters and you're in Portland Harbor because you get a better view of what's there. This could show up pretty significantly where you have a lot of buoys fairly close together. So we'll go back to the Casco Bay chart. So the other things you need to know about this are the fact that the soundings are in whatever. They're either going to be in feet or fathoms or meters. Those are the only three units that are going to be used. NOAA announced years ago that they were going to convert all nautical charts in the United States to meters so that they meet the international standard. That hasn't really happened. The United States is extremely reluctant to give up the system we use for measuring in feet and inches, even though officially we've been on the metric system for, well, since the 1800s. At any rate, you need to understand what the, what the soundings are, especially if you think they're in meters or you think they're in fathoms and they're actually in feet, because then you don't have nearly as much water under you as you think you do. Fathom, by the way, is six feet. And soundings are at mean lower low water, Lower low just means that there are two low tides in, in Casco Bay. One of the low tide, two low tides a day. One of them is a little lower than the other. So the average of the lower of the two low tides is what's used for the depth given on the chart. That means it's possible for the um, water to actually be shallower than indicated on the chart when you have an unusual tide, what would be called a drainer tide, where it goes negative below the mean lower low water. So if you're taking a look at the tide charts, if anything is identified with a negative number at low tide, 
that negative number means it's even lower than what the chart says. And that can be as much as, well, it can certainly be as much as half a foot, maybe a little bit more than that. So it's one of those things worth noting when you're looking at a chart. Down below, you often have, not always, but you often have a little table indicating generally what the tides are. The tides around Maine are a little under 10 feet generally. They can be over 10 feet. Um, and then low water is normally a little above the, um, the mean, but it can be a little below, and that's what the negative would be. Shows you some abbreviations here. We're not going to go over all these abbreviations, but you can go back and look, and if you see something, for instance, if you see something on the chart and you're wondering what does it mean, so you look it up and say, what is, why does it say Q? That would be quick. Quick flashing is a flash, 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 flash. Nautical miles are measured with just the letter M, etc. Colors are put here. So anytime you find something and you're wondering, MSG, what does MSG stand for? Mud, sand, and gravel. And all, the, all those abbreviations. So MSG is actually three abbreviations put together. As far as the rest of this up here, there's nothing that you really need to know. It is possible to measure distances using a scale. And this scale is measured in nautical miles or yards. Yards were used for a long time by people in the water, but I've never used yards to measure anything. I'm always talking about nautical miles. But yards can be useful in close quarters if you're trying to determine how far away something is. This chart, I mean, this scale duplicates the scale you would have right at the middle of the chart, right in here where you have minutes identified, and since a minute is a minute of latitude, not longitude, a minute is one nautical mile, the distance from here to here is going to be identical to the distance from here to here on that scale. Now if we take a look, obviously the tan color is land, so you're not going to navigate on the tan color. But there are a few other colors on here is worth, that are worth looking at as well. I'm looking at the Royal River right now going up into Yarmouth. The Royal River is a really good indication of this because what you have here is this kind of olive color. I don't know what they actually call it, but I call it an olive color. That's areas that are covered in water at high tide but not covered in water at low tide. And so this is, then, this is uh, illustrating what would be true in low tide. So if you're going up the Royal River and you're navigating, you have a series of buoys here that are all what are called laterally significant buoys. And it is really really easy to go aground when you're going up that river, especially at a sort of mid or mid-low tide when there might be six or seven inches of water covering this area, but it's normally mud at dead low tide. So if it doesn't look like it's actually shallow, it could still be very shallow. And there are a number of boats that have gone aground here. The good news is that it's mud. The bad news is if you go aground at a tide that is going out, You'll be sitting in that mud until the tide comes back in. Here's a case where the rule about going into an area like this on a rising tide makes a lot of sense. In fact, at low tide is the easiest time to navigate here because that's when it's obvious where the water is. High tide is where it just looks wide open, and that's not bad either because you still have, at high tide, six, seven feet of water under you. It's that sort of low mid tide where the water looks like it's deep, but it really isn't that causes the problem. As far as the buoys go, you have um, navigational buoys that are either laterally significant or they have some significance about a specific spot. Laterally significant means that the, that the um, buoys are identifying a channel where there's a right and a left, and that right and the left has to do with returning to port or leaving port. You have to be careful with that. Returning to port is not always as obvious as you might think. And we're going to take a look at another area in the chart where you have to understand when the buoys were put in, were they put in with the assumption that you are leaving Falmouth or entering Portland, or leaving Portland or entering Falmouth. And places where there are ports nearby, that can be a confusion, and it's one of those things you want to really be careful of. Because if you put yourself on the wrong side of one of these buoys, and you can see that right here, you would then in areas that don't have enough water to support the boat, possibly. And by the way, don't cut this too close. I have been in an area before where as far as how far my prop was down in the water and the number of uh, feet given on the chart would indicate that I had enough water to go through, but then sometimes there's something on the ground or on the bottom. 
In one case, it was an old mooring. The, bore, the uh, mooring buoy has gone, and the, morning, the mooring ball was gone. And I clipped the old mooring and took a couple of blades off my prop. So the um, thing here, this is the whole idea of red right returning, and that's something people think is all they need to know, but it really isn't. So if we're coming in this channel, we're going back to Yarmouth. That's the port. So the red buoys are on our right. None of these buoys is lighted, and it's not lighted, and you can tell on the chart, because unlike this buoy right here, that doesn't have a magenta circle on it. Now, by the way, you might wonder, why didn't they use red here? When people are navigating at night, <clears throat> in order to prevent night blindness, they frequently don't use a white light. They use a red light in the cabin. So if you have a red buoy, a red color on the chart, under a red light, you can't see it. So magenta is used so that it differentiates the color, even if you're looking at it under red light. So the fact that this is magenta doesn't mean that the light is magenta. It means that it has a light, period. In this case, the light is actually green. If we had, we have a, yeah, that's a white light. Um, actually, it's a yellow. <clears throat> so there is no yellow um, color that's used for the buoy. It's just left open. And I was looking for a red. Here we go. So here's a case where there's a lighted buoy. The buoy is red and the light is red. Um, and that's why that's the two colors are the same. Now you can always look and see how is it labeled. The letter R stands for red. In quotes is whatever is printed on the side of the buoy. So the number 18 is on the side of that particular buoy. And that's another really critical buoy to pay attention to. Because you got rocks all over the place between this. If you come over here to Great Shabig, this is a big mess right here. And you can see what's happening is very shallow water comes out there. So if you go cruising through there because you see a lot of water, it's very easy to hit something. So, go back up here. Yeah. So anyway, so the fact that that's a magenta, it just means that it's lighted. So it's a lighted green. Now the other thing it tells you, not just that it's green, that's the letter G in this case. In this case, it's buoy number one. It's the first buoy entering that, so it goes sequentially after that. But it also tells you that that light flashes, and it flashes green every four seconds. That means if it flashes and you start counting, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, it'll flash again. The purpose of that is so that if you're at some distance and you're looking at a buoy that's flashing or a or not just a buoy, it could also be a lighthouse or a day mark. If you see one that's flashing, you can differentiate it from other flashing buoys by indicating what the period, the flashing period is. Quick flashing, by the way, is flash, 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 and that's where you'd have the Q in there. So tan is land, olive is uncovered at low, covered at high, blue is shallow water, light blue is very shallow water. Blue is less shallow. This chart's a little bit hard to see because that looks almost greenish over here. But if you look over here where it says 26, that is less shallow than over here. And by less shallow, I mean it went from being under three fathoms to over three fathoms. If we take a look at the contour lines, contour lines are just exactly the same as if you're going hiking and you're looking at mountains. They're sort of inverted mountains underground. That 18 right there means at that line right there, on one side of it, it's deeper than 18. On the other side, it's shallower than 18. The differentiation takes place at a multiple of fathoms. And I said six feet. A fathom is six feet. So it goes from light blue to usually a little darker blue, um, at, the, at the point where it's three fathoms uh, deep. And then if you take a look at what the white is, the white goes in six fathoms. So the 36 right there means it's 36 feet deep at that edge. On one side of it, you have that shading. That means it's less than 36 feet, less than six fathoms. On the other side, it's white. White means you've got very deep water. Green means nothing about the depth. What green means is that the depths given were verified by going through, it used to be called um, by chain, where they'd literally drag a chain behind a boat and measure to see that it actually was the depths given. They don't use a chain anymore. But that just means it's verified at that depth. 
the only reason that that's there is because they don't verify all these other depths all that often and things can change over time. Okay, over here we have a great example of a lot of little asterisks. Those are all rocks. Those are rocks that are uncovered. And usually that means they're uncovered at low. That means they could be covered at high, and in fact they usually are. And so you've got to be very careful in here because you might not see them, but they could easily be there. This is just an area you'd kind of want to avoid anyway because it's only two feet deep here and there's rocks everywhere. You've also got symbols showing things like a shipwreck, which is what that is. In this particular case, it's underwater, but at low tide, there could be a part of it that's up high enough or close enough to the water that you could hit it. And that's it for right here. Well, they're kind of subtle. It's not particularly important. By the way, these uh, track lines do not show up. They don't come on the chart. Those track lines are something I added. In fact, let's, uh, let's turn those off. I don't want you thinking that every chart comes with track lines pre-drawn. Okay, so I just turned the track lines off so you wouldn't mistakenly think that's part of what we have here. Um, we've got a couple of fairly subtle things. Um, you have some text on the uh, chart that is italicized or leaning forward. And you have some text that is straight up and down. If it's straight up and down, it's identifying land masses or things on land. If it's uh, slanted, it represents things on the water. Here's an obstruction, for instance. What that obstruction means is right around here, there's something on the bottom. I don't know what it is, but there's something on the bottom. And the something on the bottom is in water that is normally 28 feet. Now, if I have my boat, which draws 18 inches to a foot and a half, I can get, I can go through water that's two feet deep and feel okay about it as long as I know there's nothing on the bottom. I'd go right over that. It wouldn't bother me one bit. But if I had a very deep draft boat, that would be something that would be of a concern. Uh, abbreviations, RK means it's rocky on the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry, RK means there's a rock there. And that's the purpose of that buoy. That's not laterally significant, in other words. You're not, you don't see that matched up with a red buoy on the other side. Red buoys, by the way, are called nuns, and green buoys are called cans. Red buoys have even numbers. Green buoys have odd numbers. Um, but this one is simply to identify the fact that there's a rock right here, and that rock is only five feet deep. RKY means rocky. That means the bottom is rocky. M means it's muddy. So the letter M means the bottom is muddy there. Why do you care about that? Because if you're going to anchor, it's a lot easier to anchor in mud than it is in grass and rocks. Rocks can be a problem when you're anchoring because your anchor can be jammed into the rocks and you might actually have to cut the line and leave it behind. Some buoys have two colors, red and green. This one's red on top, green on the bottom. It's called a nun because it's red on the top and green on the bottom. If it were the other way around, it would be um, called a can. Um, and CI is what's on the side of that because it represents Cow Island. Cow Island Ledge is right over here. Cow Island Ledge has a buoy over here that's green on the top and red on the bottom. And it's a can. That's what the letter C stands for. And it has CIL for Cow Island Ledge. Cow Island Ledge also has a light. And the light in this case is white. And it is flashing every six seconds, 23 feet, 8 nautical miles. Now what that means is 23 feet is how high it is above the um, above the uh, high water mark. Eight miles is its visibility range. In other words, you should be able to see that under perfect conditions if you're eight nautical miles or less away. Uh, the RA, by the way, means radar, radar reflector is what that means. That means if you've got radar, there's a radar reflector on here and you should be able to pick it up on your radar even at night. Let's take a look at land now. <clears throat> it actually does have some land features, and those features are for navigating. Sometimes you'll see roads, and the reason there are roads is because it's possible to see vehicles on those roads from the water. So it's a help in terms of trying to determine am I near Grand, am I near Great Island, a Great Diamond Island, or am I near Long Island? The other things you have are anything that you might be able to see from land, buildings, etc. If you have here, there's a circle with a dot in it. That dot means that it was surveyed, and that's exactly where it is, where it shows. 
over here you have another one. Um, that's just the name of that point. Um, and that's uppercase, so it's, I mean, uh, um, upright, so it's not slanted, so it's just the name of that area. And there's a church with a cross on it here. Um, FP, I don't remember what FP stands for, which is why they give you the abbreviations here. Let's go find out. F, I think it's the fire. Well, not all. Bottom characteristics, arrow. Huh. I do not remember what FP stands for. However, it doesn't matter because what I'm doing is looking for something I can see there. <coughs> Excuse me. And as long as I can see it, I'll tell that it's something sticking up in the air. FP. Well, I just don't remember. But let's take a look at the city of Portland itself. The city of Portland itself, there are a couple of things that you can see there. One of them is the cathedral. The cathedral is a church, and it sticks up because it has a spire, and churches are frequently used as navigation aids on nautical charts. And so the little dot just means it was surveyed. It's exactly there. City Hall is also high enough to be seen. Interestingly enough, there is a tower over here that was designed at one time for people to go and look for sailing ships on the way in. And that's called the Portland Observatory. And I'm never, I'm never, I always wondered why they didn't put that on there because that's also something that's very visible. You also have buildings that are visible and you notice there's a little black spot right here. That's a very tall building that you can see from almost anywhere. Um, if you're in close to shore, it'll show you pilings. And pilings are just pieces of wood or metal that are driven in to the water just so you know that they're there. Sometimes you can't see them because they're kind of broken off. Um, the channel, and this is a, a dredged channel. That's why the lines are so sharp along the sides here. And there is a note about this, and the note probably tells you the last time it was dredged. The reason it's dredged to 35 feet is so oil tankers can come up and go under the bridge. Oh, yeah, so bridges. <clears throat> there is a bridge, and there is notes about every bridge. And the notes about every bridge indicate what your clearances are. You have two types of clearances, horizontal, that's side to side. That that's matters to oil tankers. And before this new bridge was put in, the distance that you had horizontally for an oil tanker was no more than one or two feet wider than the width of the oil tanker, which is why the Julianne hit the bridge one time, ripped the side open, and had oil spilled all over the place. Vertical clearance is up and down at high tide. So the, the, the most clearance you have is at low tide, but the least clearance you have is at high tide, and that's 55 feet. Now, this is a bascule bridge. That means it opens. So once it opens, that vertical clearance goes to infinity, and then, you know, you can uh, get through there. TR Tower. You know, there's a bunch of towers here, and those towers are from left over from World War II, when they put towers up so they could see things, standpipes or water towers. I think there is, yeah, this is interesting. There's a house with a cupola, and that's so visible and so noticeable that it's considered a good navigational aid. Oh, some buoys have bells on them. Those bells are there so that if they're at night, it makes a sound. Some of them actually have horns, but a bell dings, a gong sounds like a gong. And there's a difference between a bell, a gong, and a horn. Um, and if you take a look over at Portland Harbor, I mean, uh, South Portland, Portland Headlight. So Portland Headlight has a number of things going on. It has a light that flashes every four seconds. It's 101 feet off the, off the uh, ground, and it has a 19-mile range of visibility. That means you can be in clear conditions you can be 19 miles away and still see the top of this where the light is actually going on. It has a horn, and that horn goes off whenever it's foggy. And it has, um, a, and it's a sector light, and there's a sector light that's down below the, the uh, white light. The sector light is red, white, and green, and it's 34 feet off the ground, and it's flashing. No, I'm sorry, it's fixed. That sector light means that if you are out here, those lines indicate that if you're right here, that sector light should look white. If you're outside the sector light, it's going to be red. 
And the reason it's going to be red, here we go. Some place when you have a sector light, it shows you where the colors are. So the white sector is in the middle. <clears throat> you can be headed right down that white sector in a very large ship and not worry about going aground. The red sector means avoid this area because there's some kind of an obstruction that if your boat has a deep enough draft, you might have a problem with. And the green sector means you're in safe water. The other sector light that you're more familiar with is the one on our campus. And that's this one right here. So there's your sector light here. And again, if you go out far enough, it'll show you what the sectors mean. And doesn't it show you? Well, in this case, I'll tell you what the sectors mean. It's a sector light, and if you're seeing it white, you can come right down the channel with no problem at all. Oh, right here. <clears throat> Sorry, I went out a little too far. So if you're right here and you can see that light and it looks white, that means you're in safe water, and you can see there's even a navigation buoy here. That one's green. It's lighted. You're coming back, so it would leave it on your left. But you can come right down through here without any danger of going aground. If it's red, that means you're off to the right, where you've got all kinds of problems over here. Or you're off to the left, where you have all kinds of problems over here. And interestingly enough, it even shows red on the ground. So if you're on campus and you're looking at that light, the chances are 100% that it'll be red, not white. In order to see it as white, you have to be out in the water. I think that is enough for now. Um, you know, you obviously have a lot of, a lot of things going on. Oop, I just had my alarm go off. I have to go teach a class. All right, so that's enough for right now. I will point out, like here you have this gong. Reefs are identified. Um, yeah, here, so we've got a root coming out. All right, so here's part of that sector light right here. And if you notice that sector light from Portland Head, it keeps coming down, keeps coming down, keeps coming down. Um, when it comes down here, the idea is to keep you off of Trendy Reef. And that's one of those things where it comes out a little further than you might think. And so people in small boats are in danger of hitting that rock and going aground when they come in here. And the shading is such that, you know, if you're in white water, you are, you're able to navigate. These are all just um, essentially highways that are laid out for very large tankers, aircraft carriers, whatever. And those are known as chips channels. And those channels have a um, essentially um, a, um, a street kind of layout where two deep water vessels when they're meeting stay to the right of the channel in either direction just like if you're driving on a highway. I think that's enough for this. There are a number of other things about this chart and I, would, I did want to point out that there is something called chart one. Chart one, if you took a look at it, is um, it's not really a chart at all. It's really just a table of abbreviations and terms and symbols. But if I go down through this, if you decided to read chapter one and memorize everything in it, you enjoy your weekend because you're going to see a lot of stuff going on here. And all the various symbols in, uh, that are used on the chart, the abbreviations, they're all laid out here. So for instance, I probably can figure out what that FP stands for if I look hard enough here. Um, but you can see like those are identifying uh, things that you can see a silo and elevator. They're specifically labeled just like the church was also labeled. The cathedral was labeled. But I will uh, I'll check and see what that is. You see I just want to take one last look and see if there's anything else. Well we've talked about this for navigation but you have a compass rose on every chart. Um, so just one last thing. The compass rose is actually two compass roses. You've got um, orientation true, and true means zero is at normally the top. Sometimes charts are skewed, but for the most part, north is up, and that's the north star kind of arrow. Um, so then it also tells you magnetic, because the magnetic north varies depending on where you are on Earth. And it tells you here that this is a 15 degree, 15 minute west variation. That means magnetically, when you think you're headed north because your compass says zero, you're not really headed north. You're a little bit west of north. And that's why it says west down here. And by a little bit, I mean 15 degrees, 15 minutes. It tells you the date that that was true. And it also, so you can kind of get a sense since it's been three years or four years since that date, it's got an annual decrease of five minutes. Well, five times four is 20 minutes. 
So that means you might be down under 15 degrees. On the other hand, this is not linear. It changes over time. That's why they actually put the date on here. Sometimes it's decreasing you know, fairly regularly, and then it goes and reverses and starts to increase. So the, the magnetic variation really depends on the flux generated by molten iron deep underground. And because it's molten, it does move around a little bit. And as it moves, it changes what's called an agonic line. It changes how your compass lines up over that spot. And I'll just one more reminder on a compass. It does not point to anything. It lines up with a magnetic flux line directly under your boat.